on Facebook via live stream and on YouTube via live stream and everyone who's joining us here at Toronto Centre Place. Um, we did this as a uh, last minute scheduling uh, switch as we were just talking about. The um, topic that we were going to do this week, uh, we'll talk Badass of BBs, is actually going to take place now next week. And so we didn't get to advertise this topic um, anyway ahead of time, but we are any more than just last week, but it's still going to be, a, we think, a pretty good presentation. And so we want to welcome everyone to our history, theology, and philosophy meetup. My name is John Hamer, and I serve as the coordinator of the meetup. We always begin with our mission, which is to invite everyone into community, to continually learn and grow, to abolish poverty and end needless suffering, to promote peace and justice, and to live life meaningfully together. And so, Badass Habibis has been moved, and so what we're gonna do, if you did come, oh my goodness, can I get some, like a, I cut myself. Oh, dear. Oh. Um, uh, just a tissue, I'll be fine. <laughs> anyway, so this is, oh, thank you, he has one. I'm just gonna hold. The show will go on, <laughs> no worries. So um, the topic, Badass Habibis, which is to say how women shaped the history of early Islam, um, that's going to be next week. So if you were coming for that, you will hopefully have a topic tonight that you will still find interesting. We think something on the similar, anyway, theme. Oh, you actually have a band-aid? Yes, I actually have a band-aid. Wow, you guys are really prepared. <laughs> Okay. The original title? The context of Oh, really? Wow. Maybe I should put on for you? Let nope, I got it. Yourself? Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I think I'll be okay. Oh, no, yeah. <laughs> You'll live. I'll live. But our uh, topic tonight, our topic tonight is the divine feminine in Greek mythology, and specifically we're going to look at uh, the idea of um, a great goddess, maybe underlying Greek mythology as we have it emerging in the historic period. So there's been a hypothesis about that, and we are going to a hypothesis about that, and we're going to explore the evidence behind it. We'll always um, remind everybody who's joining us that um, our uh, programming is listener supported and we really appreciate uh, your donations. You can always make those at centerplace.ca, our website. There's PayPal buttons and your donations um, are tax deductible in the United States and Canada. So thank you again. Okay. Um, when I was a kid and I studied uh, Greek mythology as kind of a hobby, um, I was also kind of a genealogist, and I like to do family trees and try to figure out how are all of these, uh, as I'm reading about the myths, how does this family tree work, which it's fairly complicated. And so I didn't make this one, but I, um, there's one that's for sale uh, on the internet anyway that talks about um, the different um, successive waves, essentially, of how the Greek gods and goddesses work. Uh, emerging out of essentially the primordial, you can't probably see this, but I'll just you can do this anyway. <laughs> essentially emerging out of chaos are these primordial gods, the first being Gaia, which is to say Mother Earth. Mother Earth then, uh, from her, by herself, <laughs> brings forth Uranus, Uranus, the sky, uh, and then they together uh, become the consorts of the next generation, but there are also emerging out of uh, chaos other primordial forces like darkness and night and so, so forth. Um, from uh, earth and sky, um, they bring forth the next layer of uh, these gods. So prior to the gods of um, the historic period are these kind of titans. Uh, and so like in the movies like Clash of the Titans, these are these earlier uh, autochthonic monster slash gods that are representing this older form of divinities. And they include um, Kronos and Rhea, 
which are again sky and uh, earth um, goddesses, and that they together, brother and sister, um, bring forth then the next generation, the gods who are at the apex in the um, developed period of Greek mythology when we're first, uh, when it's first emerging into um, the literary age, so when the first uh, oral poets, Homer, who's composing the, if Homer is a real person, but anyway, the author of the, uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey, and also Hesiod, who um, has a uh, large number of very early poems as well, are kind of telling and formulating uh, in, in the earlier oral tradition, um, the stories of and explaining where all the gods come from and this sort of thing, weaving them together and making these kind of family charts. Um, when that happens, uh, when that time period is happening at the beginning of when uh, the Greeks now develop writing and they start leaving a historical record for us, we have the Olympian gods of which the chief uh, is Zeus and his sister wife Hera but all of the other ones that are very famous to us, people like Poseidon and Hades and Demeter and Athena and Hephaestus and Ares and Aphrodite and so on, Apollo uh, and Artemis and so forth. Yes? Please, Jane. what is the date that those gods came into, came into the imagination? Yeah, so um, Jane is asking, what, what are we going to do for dates? When are these um, going to start to be come into being? And so all we can say is that in the 8th and 7th, this kind of centuries, this is when, uh, BC, this is when the oral poets are composing these particular texts, and this is also um, kind of when um, ancient Greek is developing now as a, as a writing system, so when they adopt the ancient Greek alphabet. And so it's only at this point, all of this is already developed by the time we get our first um, records of it. And so to decide when, how long has Zeus existed, uh, it goes back into prehistory and the, therefore we can't um, actually date it at all. Not to mention Gaia not to mention Gaia or any of these. So all of these are formulated prior to the historic period. Um, but what do, is happening in the historic period uh, is this formulation where they're trying to make essentially family trees and they're trying to systematize it. They're trying to understand um, th that everybody's different view that, for example, um, let's say, who is descended from who. So the idea that your so-and-so is Zeus's daughter as opposed to Zeus's wife or, or maybe two completely unrelated gods, now we maybe understand, well, those are actually both are Zeus and they are married to so-and-so. And so in other words, trying to make this kind of system um, is a late uh, addition to the whole thing. So initially, um, it would be highly localized Everybody would have had all of their own stories and tales and names, um, and they really would be con very contradictory <laughs> uh, to any kind of a timeline. So because they weren't um, referring to historical events, obviously they're referring to individualized local mythologies. And so um, this sort of um, um, thing, <laughs> like I was doing you know, as a kid when I was making my own little family charts to try to figure out Okay, now Zeus uh, married so and so, and that had these, you know, had these offspring and this sort of thing. Um, it doesn't actually really work because, in fact, it's there are multiple competing um, places and explanations, uh, and it also becomes uh, insanely complicated. And so, for example, uh, one of the things that we find out pretty quickly is uh, that although Zeus has um, what we may call a main, his main wife, Hera. He is not particularly um, monogamous with her, <laughs> you know. And so, and indeed, um, uh, just I, it, it can't be charted out. But essentially, it's charted in a different way. We just have this um, comparative table in Wikipedia. Actually, is where I found it of Zeus's family, where we take essentially a column here. These are his divine lovers. Some people like that we know very well, Aphrodite, Demeter, and then these are the children by them, and so, so on and so forth. Then this next column here is another set from the divine lovers. Then this next column over here has gotten over to now mortal consorts, so people like Cassiopeia, 
as a, a human woman that you know, also has offspring by Zeus. But this chart all by itself, just to point out here, this goes on four pages on this screen. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so it is, and so not only uh, do we have on the one occasion here, um, you know, we had up there the idea that in one of the versions of the stories that, um, that Persephone is the, uh, the daughter of Zeus by Demeter, but in a different uh, myth, we have that Persephone is the um, lover of Zeus and has these offspring, right? And so that um, doesn't, isn't necessarily totally contradictory in <laughs> Greek mythology because they, um, you are, there is all kinds of incest going on in, in these. Certainly sisters are, are very often consorts, but sometimes also sons and daughters are also consorts as they're understood. And in any event, it just becomes impossible to chart. <laughs> That's all I wanted, wanted to say by pointing this all out to begin with. This very complicated thing that um, attempts to be imposed upon um, um, these original stories, these original stories that they didn't start with the chart and then start telling stories. Rather, they started with the stories and then tried to make a chart. <laughs> and we find that that's actually not, not possible without contradicting it. So the kind of the question um, that I want to pose or that is being posed by the topic tonight is, to what extent does telling these stories of Zeus as the father and or the lover of all of these goddesses um, and remembering and retelling those stories in the historic period, to what extent does that represent a subordination of pre-existing goddess cults in all kinds of different places to an emerging patriarchal religion of ancient Greece? So to what extent is that there was a powerful, um, let's say, mother goddess Demeter in um, one of the cities of ancient Greece, and at some point or other, um, she becomes understood to be the sister and wife of Zeus in order to make it so that Zeus is kind of the person who's in charge and therefore the patriarchy of Greek society is actually in charge of maybe the women in Greek society. Since in the historic period um, uh, that emerges out of the Greek Dark Ages when we start to see classical Greece. Classical Greece has all kinds of, um, let's say, wonderful things that we look back to as a uh, innovative and artistic and, and uh, formulating philosophy and democracy and things like that. But uh, egalitarianism regarding gender isn't really on the top of uh, the list of good things the Greeks were doing. <laughs> so especially, for example, in, uh, in Athens, which is where we we tend to focus our attention. Athens was uh, a lot less uh, gender, had a lot less gender equality uh, than, for example, some of the other Greek states that um, are Athens rivals who we don't follow as well. So for example, the Spartans may well have had a more gender equity and more roles for women um, than Athens. Okay, so that's kind of the question that we're posing. So, <laughs> When we're talking about gods and goddesses, um, we also are dealing with uh, English and some of the issues with gendered language in English that have been um, with us for a whole long time, but that we've been maybe especially aware of in the last half century or so. Um, and so I guess at the Academy Awards this year, Renee Zellweger won the Academy Award for Best Actress for her portrayal of uh, in the movie Judy, of Judy Garland. Um, and I guess Joaquin Phoenix won the Academy Award for Best Actor for his role in, in playing the Joker in his movie. And so um, the implication of the awards, <laughs> sort of, is that the word actor kind of equals male and the word actress equals female in the sense that um, they give out two awards and you have to be a male actor in order to win the uh, actor, best actor award and you have to be a female actress in order to win the best actress award. Um, and I don't know how they're, I mean I know that Hollywood is, or the Academy anyway has really struggled with um, 
you know, like racial inclusiveness, <laughs> you know, and, and things like that. And they've been, I guess, trying to work on it. But I don't know how good they've gotten and how they figured out um, the whole gender non-binary thing yet or what they're going to do about that. But anyway, <laughs> so we'll see in the future how they're dealing with, with this idea. Um, but um, even though the awards imply that, um, if we look up the current dictionary definition of actor, um, actor includes all people who act. So it's not, it has to be a gender specific word. So Renee uh, Zellwinger is also an actor in addition to being an actress. And so um, she's an actor and an actress, he's an actor but not an actress, right? The way the words work. And so this is because um, though, <laughs> Not so much because the word actor is so much that it's an inclusive word, although it has becoming inclusive, but also because it's also true because uh, the male form here has been a default identity. And so the word has meant that you know, it's a you know, actors are, are male or, or people because males you know, is the default gender in, in history and in, anyway, the social circumstances here. So it's not that we have an inclusive word, um, but rather it's a word that is becoming more inclusive, but in fact is existing this way because of male uh, being portrayed as a default gender. And so anyway, we lack a specific word, a word to specify male actors, although we can use it that way. So historically, <laughs> Um, if we'd replace this, we have the same problem with the word uh, man and woman. So man, historically, uh, is inclusive of male men and female men. Um, and so originally that's because man is the default, is default language as opposed to inclusive language. And so for example, mankind, right? Uh, however, uh, as that's evolved in the last half century, we now largely use the word human uh, in place of uh, the inclusive or default man, and the word man has largely become exclusive to male, right? And so as a result, we say humankind, uh, and more so often than saying mankind any, anymore, right? And humanity. so, or humanity instead of mankind. And so in Star Trek, they stopped saying where no man has gone before and they started saying where no one has gone before, right? <laughs> so that's how things have changed. And we also started renaming um, words that have the suffix man on the end of it. So obviously uh, women, male men are now, <laughs> obviously we don't use that word, we use male carrier and we largely replace words like milkman and mailman. Um, in other places where we have a word like chairman, we often still will use the word chairman, and that one hasn't been as eliminated as much as um, has been added to. So we also say chairperson or we say chair, and that hasn't, um, t those two haven't totally displaced saying chairman for a, a male chairman or even a female chairman, but anyway. And the same thing would be congressman. Uh, where people will still say congressman, but they also say congresswoman, congressperson. So um, anyway, it's still an ongoing process uh, as these are all happening. Okay, so we have the same problem, <laughs> I think, with God and goddess. We just don't use these words as much anymore um, because we have largely, our, anyway, in the West anyway, we largely um, have gone from a uh, polytheistic uh, religions to monotheism and or uh, no religion. And so um, anyway, we have the same idea where God maybe in a sense is, um, seems like it might be exclusively male. Certainly goddess is being exclusively female, but that's actually um, more like what we do with actor and actress, which is to say um, goddesses are gods, but gods are not goddesses, right? And it's again not unfortunately because of uh, the, the word God is inclusive as so much the word God is uh, default language. So um, we've talked an awful lot uh, in, in a bunch, bunch of our lectures about how um, the idea of God in Abrahamic religion, so in Islamo-Judeo-Christianity, is not meant to represent um, uh, a being that is 
thought of, supposed to be thought of as exclusively male. Uh, generally, um, in fact, most of the theologians are always going to argue that God transcends gender or is inclusive of both genders or however it's understood. Uh, and that's how, and, and so we actually had a, one of our medieval uh, English mystics um, uh, was talking about God or envisioning God as, as our heavenly mother. Uh, and that was totally within Christian orthodoxy of even the Middle Ages because, uh, again, God and the Christian understanding is inclusive of both genders, and that's true, anyway, in general of Abrahamic religion. And yet, we um, assign God, he, him, pronouns almost all the time by, by linguistic tradition in English, anyway. And so, he, him pronouns, because that's been the default uh, pronoun, nevertheless, it also um, is because male is the default gender, and so it also gives people the default picture, let's say, when you're Christian and they're picturing God um, as uh, being male, right? So we also say things like father, and so that tends to sound like a rejection uh, of the divine feminine. In other words, that God isn't actually inclusive uh, of the divine feminine in this kind of a conception as it hardens in this uh, male picturing or male uh, vision of monotheism. And so, somehow, even though with all of the complexity and craziness that we've talked about over in Christianity of having three persons in a trinity, so you have one God, but uh, you have three persons as we are understanding it, somehow they still, um, we still have failed to get a she, her <laughs> person of the Trinity in essentially it's the common understanding of it, right? So we have God in three persons and, and at least father and son in terms of persons uh, have kind of male conceptions with he, him pronouns. Spirit kind of too, I don't know, you don't, don't often say, depends on if you say Holy Spirit, he, him, or if you say Holy Spirit, it, because people I think are, are less aware or deciding, even Christians deciding what do they exactly mean by how the Holy Spirit works, but it will also say Holy Spirit, he, him. So somehow, none of these inclusive of she, her, and therefore, again, seeming to expel the divine feminine. Um, of course, in Orthodox and Catholic imagery, um, Mary uh, takes on the role that had been existing in past uh, pre-Christian, pre-Abrahamic religions, so the old religions, what we sometimes call paganism, uh, of Greece and Rome, takes on the same kind of role of the goddess, uh, and so, although she's not a goddess, but nevertheless, um, she has a titles like Mother of God, which is going to be very similar in terms of titles and also iconography to some of these great goddesses of the ancient religions. So, for example, Isis, who is a mother of, again, a dying god, her uh, uh, consort, uh, Osiris. Um, another one is, uh, as queen of heaven, Mary also takes on the role of God's wife, although Mary's, again, not God's wife <laughs> uh, in Christianity explicitly, uh, and so, but still portrayed here as uh, when, when in, for example, a Byzantine kind of mosaic here, uh, when Christ is sort of portrayed as a Byzantine emperor, then um, his, Mary is often portrayed kind of as a Byzantine empress. <laughs> and so again, what we end up having iconographically here is a sense of Mary as queen of heaven, that's her title, and so therefore wife of God, um, and also taking on the traditional roles um, that a medieval queen, a medieval empress would have. So, for example, uh, the king is meant to be very stern and is always insisting on justice, but the queen intercedes on behalf of the petitioner uh, and in order to beg for mercy and clemency, and this is a role that actually happened in medieval courts, and so medieval queens often did exercise that role, and Mary is portrayed doing that, and is also, that seems, that's her uh, her overt function throughout uh, antiquity and the Middle Ages. So again, the same kind of role that would have been uh, very familiar, and even titles that would have been very familiar to um, uh, the goddesses of the old religions that precede uh, Islamo-Judeo-Christianity. Okay, so although <laughs> then 
Mary occupies uh, the same real estate, maybe, as the goddess. Mary is not a god or a goddess in this kind of high formulation of uh, Christian um, theology. And indeed, when the Protestants um, come along, <laughs> Uh, the Protestants decide, wait a second, this whole thing seems way too much like paganism. Uh, there's all of these ways in which this sounds like what, what the, the old religions that went before. And so largely, uh, the Protestants actually get rid of Mary and indeed all of the um, veneration of feminine divine saints. And so therefore, further purge um, uh, the heavenly real estate of the divine feminine uh, and make this whole thing be way more patriarchal uh, in appearance, too. And in addition to, it was pretty patriarchal the whole time, <laughs> you know, in terms of practice, but uh, all the way back to the ancient Greeks, but in event, it was also now in, also in form. Okay. So, in that sense, when we get to this kind of period of time in modern times with the Protestants where we uh, have effectively purged uh, the divine feminine from, from heaven. Um, we do seem like, that does seem like the capstone maybe in terms of evolution of a long process of going in that particular direction. So, um, you know, from uh, where they are to maybe where classical philosophers were when they're arguing in, es in es essence that uh, Zeus is the one God but there's this default language essentially where the feminine divine is also part of God and so forth and so forth to maybe an earlier phase of paganism uh, when it first is emerging uh, in the uh, historical period. In other words, when we first have these myths that are being written down where we have male and female gods, gods and goddesses that are on, let's say, a more equal footing than what ultimately happens. And so then if we can kind of look past <laughs> We can't because we don't have the history, but if we could get a window then, if we kind of just roll this back, what's, what's before this in terms of the trend lines? <laughs> Is there maybe um, something underneath here or something that went before here where um, there was, as a default, the divine feminine, the goddess, uh, of which maybe there is a male god, a male uh, counterpart who is, though nevertheless, encompassed within a more of a default female uh, divine. So is it possible that there, uh, anyway, that that's what actually comes before, you know, this time period that emerges in the historical period? And that's been something that people have wondered about, especially, um, it's about, about a little over a century, but it, it got especially um, uh, formulated in the second half of the 20th century as people were looking into the archaeology. Okay. So, Archaeological finds um, that happened in the 20th century gave us some very tantalizing um, ideas that this could possibly be the case, right? So the prehistoric era uh, refers to this time period before we have written records. So we need written records in order to reconstruct uh, the most likely narrative of what happened historically. So if there is no written record, we can't have the narrative. <laughs> there may well be some, some preserved oral tradition it ultimately has to get written down for us to even have the access to the oral tradition. Um, but in any event, um, oral tradition can also evolve over time uh, unless they're doing very particular things to maintain it memorized as is. So uh, when we are doing this then, when we're trying to reach into the black box of prehistory, um, one of the big tools that we have going for us nowadays in modern times is archeology. span And so archeologists have um, you know, been digging up stuff all over the place, <laughs> and have also um, worked very well on, on doing their, how they do relative dating and carbon dating and everything else. And so they have dated, um, they've dug up and found, you may well have seen that, how many people have seen this figure before? So yeah, so this um, Venus, it's called Venus of Willendorf because it's a figurine uh, uh, of essentially a female figure uh, that is found in a town called you know, Willendorf in Austria. Um, even though it's called a Venus of Willendorf, when that's been, been applied 
in modern times too, it, it's not buried with something that has, let's say, writing where it says Venus on it or something like that. And indeed, um, because it's dated to, let's say, 30,000 years ago, there is no writing. And so it is impossible for us to, um, to have any kind of writing from that. Shaheen has a question. Since we're speaking of Venus, um, one of the myths about the origins of Aphrodite states that she was not a daughter of Zeus, but that she was formed by, um, it was either uh, Cronus or Uranus's penis that got cut off. Right. And then mm -hmm. just sort of like fell into the ocean and frothed about. And from that mix of sea foam and semen, Aphrodite was born around, uh, she was formed around Cyprus and then floated towards the land and then joined the Pantheon. Right, exactly. And so there are all kinds of these, um, <laughs> anyway, so they don't, they, everybody isn't always, uh, all of these goddesses aren't always thought of as being, like you say, uh, the sister or daughter of Zeus, and there may be other, for some of them, that are that appear more powerful and more primordial, or that maybe the Greeks are aware of coming from, from foreign places. And so Aphrodite and her um, younger lover consort Adonis um, have a Middle Eastern origin, probably, you know, so via Cyprus, maybe. And so, for example, her, her lover Adonis, uh, you know, is related to this word in, in Aramaic, Adonai, Lord. And so, um, as a result of that, she may well be, you know, like an import essentially of though a, um, a one of these powerful mother goddesses who have this younger um, uh, fertility consort, the younger guy who's the lesser essentially between her and and the and the consort. Um, uh, one of the things that um, that happens though in the myths is that uh, Aphrodite then, as as the time gets. Um, uh, as the stories evolve and as she's brought into uh, mainline Greek paganism, often she'll be portrayed as, um, you know, as as fickle and as as a as a adulteress, and she would be she'll get shamed, and so she's married to a, a, a god that is Zeus's um, child, who's lame. So the um, uh, the Hephaestus the the uh, forge god, and, and then she has a lover in terms of Ares, the war god, another of Zeus's uh, children, and, and then they're captured, embarrassing her, right? And so there's all of these different ways that uh, maybe the myths are designed to um, diminish uh, what may be pre-existing very powerful mother goddesses that um, maybe aren't even originally described as um, having where, where it needs a male component for them to have been generated at all. Certainly, as we saw right at the very beginning when we were talking about the um, about Gaia and the later formulations, uh, Gaia as Earth or as the uh, most um, uh, the least anthropomorphic Earth goddess in in the later formulations of Greek uh, mythology, um, she essentially is self-formed out of out of chaos. And so in those kind of senses, there is this tradition of that uh, retain, being kept in the myth. So I agree. So, um, the city of the Oracle of Delphi? Um, you, you, you yeah, the, there, there's a hypothesis that the Pythia, who was the um, priestess that would give the oracles at the temple of Delphi, although she was uh, later seen as under Apollo, as Apollo's priestess, um, it there's a theory that it goes back to an earlier time when it was, when she was basically the prophetess of a, f of a female god that was then, you know, in myths is shown as being defeated as the python by mm. Apollo. And then, you know, when this patriarchal culture comes in and takes over and turns the tables. Right, yep. So there's all kinds of these, in, like we say, in all the kind of local uh, iterations, and so that's why we're wondering, is there something more behind, behind this? And so this is something that's now dot, 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 way before. <laughs> and, so, and so now that we're looking in the archeological records, in other words, into prehistory, this is taking us way into prehistory. Um, and so what are these like? So these are coming from the late Stone Age, so the Upper Paleolithic era, 
Um, these figurines have just very interestingly, there's over 200 of these has been found. Um, they have very exaggerated female characteristics, so they have big breasts and hips and uh, genitalia, but then they tend to have, they don't ha either don't have faces or they don't have hands or those are much smaller uh, in comparison. As I mentioned here, the name Venus, although um, um, modern people have applied those, we don't have any name that dates back to them um, because they're from before writing. Um, so there aren't any corresponding male figurines generally with these. And so um, are these goddesses without gods? And so the idea of these, and among other, other evidence too, that we'll look at, led uh, Maria Gambudis, who is an archeologist in the middle of the 20th century, to theorize then that prior to these patriarchal pantheons uh, that we see in the historical period, the classic age of Greece, that there may well have been an older religion focused on goddesses and even on the idea of the goddess. Elizabeth. It makes sense that there was a time when people did not know, they knew about mothers, they didn't know about fathers. It's not really intuitively obvious, is it? <laughs> Well, you definitely know about mothers. Yeah, I guess it doesn't necessarily follow, but I don't know. <laughs> People have, have uh, interesting ideas anyway about where babies come from. <laughs> and they continued to into the classical times. Okay, so Maria Gambudis is also um, famous as an archaeologist for formulating what's called the Kurgan hypothesis in the 1950s. And so the idea of this is, we've talked about this a bunch of different times too, that we have the uh, linguists uh, when they were studying uh, how languages evolve and change over time, people noticed that, for example, uh, Sanskrit, this ancient language of India, has all these things in common with the uh, ancient languages of Iran and actually also with Latin and Greek. And there's all kinds of things that show them to be related languages. And so therefore, um, they ultimately were able to make a family tree that creates this Indo-European family of languages where we understand everything from, from Celtic to uh, Latin to, again, so to all the Indian languages and things like that, or not all of them, but anyway, the northern ones are, uh, are all related to each other. And so, based on um, the fact that they're, okay, well, where did these people then all come from was, becomes the question. Where were the Indo-Europeans or who were the people that are the origin who spoke the proto-language that has now uh, descended into all these different ways? And so her hypothesis is that based on being, she's an archeologist, so based on several digs um, in Eastern Ukraine, uh, they're called Kurgans or burial mounds in Russian. And so uh, these Kurgans hypothesis is that they came uh, from here and then went all the different places that Indo-European languages are now found uh, in prehistoric and then historic times. And so there have been now some genetic studies, I guess there are three that were done in 2015, that seem to lend support to this particular hypothesis. So this is one of the ways that people are kind of leaning. In other words, that the uh, Eastern Europeans maybe did, she, maybe she's quite right from her, that they could be equated with the archeological remains that uh, they're found here in Eastern Ukraine. Okay, so the Kirkin hypothesis in pop culture, you may remember from the movie Highlander, which is certainly a popular movie for my, my, when I was 16. <laughs> anyway, there are these immortals. Uh, and the oldest of the immortals is this guy who's called the Kurgan. And why is he called the Kurgan? He's called the Kurgan because of this hypothesis. <laughs> so in other words, he's from the original tribe of Indo-Europeans and pop, presumably according to the movie, the reason why the Indo-Europeans conquered everybody is because they had this immortal, uh, violent war warrior leader who helped them take over everything, right? And so that may well be. But anyway, according to the, the movie, what, that, what they mean. It's a popularization though of this idea of why did the Indo-Europeans, why did they be able to conquer everything and spread so much? But there's other possibilities too, and there's other theories. <laughs> so of why, for example, uh, nomads who are warriors who are coming off the steppes uh, may well have been able to spread. Uh, they may have some other technological advantage, whether it's a particular domestication of the kind of horse uh, or, or also an early adoption of different kinds of iron um, weapons and chariots and so on. And so uh, anyway, that's the Kurgan. So, 
After uh, Maria Gimbutas um, has formulated that, her later work in the second half of the 20th century um, was on, though, this idea of uh, the mother goddess and um, these figurines and the societies that existed before the Euro Indo-Europeans um, overran them all. And so um, she argues then, before these nomad warriors left the steppes, that those guys brought with them um, their sky gods, uh, warrior sky gods, that then the societies that, that were there beforehand that had these figurines perhaps um, worshipped nature and earth goddesses and were largely peaceful and were maybe matristic is the word I think she is using in nature. She says that she wants to avoid matriarchal because um, that was going to be pretty uh, a big controversy and indeed it ends up being a very controversial hypothesis regardless of the word you mean. So, so if you say matristic or matrilocal, matrifocal, matrilineal, matriarchal, what, is, what do all of these different um, words mean? So lots and lots of societies, both in the present day and historically, have been unambiguously patriarchal. So where male as a gender have more social, economic, political uh, power and this sort of things, um, most anthropologists today contend that there aren't actually, uh, anyway, presently, any uh, societies that are unambiguously matriarchal, and that also within the historical period, you know, so when we were actually talking about not this prehistoric times, but in the historical period, um, there are also no matriarchies, which is to say societies where women unambiguously rule um, aren't found to exist in the historical record. However, there's a lot of different societies that have some of these other characteristics that we're talking about here. So in some cases, mothers, for example, head the families, so they're therefore matrifocal. In some couples, so when you have a married couple, uh, they will live near the wife's parents. So for example, that'll mean that they're matrilocal. They're not just gonna, uh, in, some, in some it would be the opposite, right? Where you, uh, the wife, uh, like in the Western um, tr uh, marriage tradition, is essentially led by her father to her, you know, down the aisle and in hand, given her in hand to her husband to signify that essentially this is going to be a patrilocal um, marriage, uh, in, in at least symbolically and, in, and traditionally and historically in the West. In this case, it would be you're living near the wife's parents. And in some of these societies, um, descent is traced through the female line. So um, whether you're going to be the next chief is, is not relevant whether your dad was a chief, but it's relevant whether your, uh, uh, let's say your mom's brothers were chiefs, <laughs> and so on, because so, it's descending in the female line. And so, for example, the Haudenosaunee, um, the Iroquois Confederacy, the six uh, nations here in North America are traditionally um, matrilocal and matrilineal, I think. And so they are, um, and anyway, there's several societies and all not, it's not an uncommon thing for societies to have one or more of these uh, traits. But what we haven't found anyway within the historical record or in current societies anywhere is one that is unambiguously um, matriarchal. Do you have a question, Jane? Yeah. What was the book and the author that you had in? The book and the author before was The Civilization of the Goddess. The World of Old Europe by Maria Gimbutas. She has actually several, and so, yeah. Yeah, um, uh, Maria Gimbutas actually specifically um, studied uh, a Neolithic, late Neolithic culture in roughly that part of the world. Um, it was uh, centered largely around uh, river valleys in Western Ukraine and Northern Romania, and they were called the Trapelians, is the Trapelian culture. Mm. And um, it was surprisingly elaborated. They had communities apparently as, uh, a village, if you can call them villages, towns, of as many as 20,000 people. I, um, we went to uh, an exhibit at the ROM uh, of Trapelian artifacts that was uh, in Toronto, I'm guessing about 10 years ago. Huh? And um, so they had very large uh, settlements in some cases. And uh, their buildings, were, uh, their dwelling places were like two stories tall in some cases. So in other words, quite, quite advanced in terms of their um, uh, construction methods. And what was interesting about this culture was that they found 
no trace of what appeared to be weapons of war or defenses around these communities. Mm. So they seemed to be peaceable. They were agrarian. Um, they also uh, kept livestock, mm -hmm. but no weapons of war. And it wasn't until the coming of what, by archaeologists, is called the Badlax culture, aptly right. named, <laughs> who were a warlike culture, that um, that signs of strife and uh, destruction of these towns and beginnings of defenses were to be seen. And so this culture goes back to about five to 6,000 BCE. Yeah, well, very good, thank you. Yeah, so we are gonna, I'm, 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 I'm glad you brought those, that culture up because I'm, there's a bunch of these that we're kind of dealing with and I'm looking at ones that are closer to Greece when we're gonna get to the ancient Greeks. But there's a, uh, there are several, um, like you say, where some of the archeological evidence you know, has seemed to be pointing that way. In other words, where there are, uh, where we have cultures that are, let's say, seem to be peaceful in the sense that they're not concentrating on building uh, defenses. They're nevertheless highly organized and are building nice big complex villages even though they're pre-literate. And they may well also be including, uh, in some of the cases, um, a focus on the feminine divine in terms of the, the artifacts that they've left. Uh, and, that, uh, and that those then are confronting potentially some of these other societies that are uh, sky god focused and maybe axe focused. <laughs> I just, sorry, one last little thing I forgot. Indeed, um, in the Trapillion culture, what they found was no end of female figurines, highly yeah. elaborated. They had very, very evolved pottery work, yeah. including gorgeous, gorgeous vases, uh, sorry, um, bowls and vases with beautiful, beautiful designs. But anyway, lots and lots of female figurines and also uh, incisions like etchings on uh, their clay artifacts that seem to uh, symbolize what they speculate is to do with the goddess like bird figures. Mm. So there was a, apparently a bird goddess around that time. Later in Europe, you get all kinds of images of um, bird goddesses. Um, but anyway, that, that they think that this might have been kind of a pre-writing. You know, sort of they're trying to figure that out. <laughs> yeah, very good, thank you. Okay, so what well, I'm just gonna say that it, um, just, we don't have it and have any of these now, <laughs> although we have some uh, interesting, some interesting things where societies are not fully patriarchal, right? There's a bunch of societies which are much more egalitarian uh, gender-wise. Okay, so what about before history? And so as we were just talking about, <laughs> you know, in, there are lots of these um, uh, remnants and remains um, that are also um, very enticing and there's also have all kinds of exciting traces. And so the question is, is it possible that um, um, before writing, that there were societies where this historic imbalance that we have uh, in, in the historic period was actually even reversed. So where there may have been um, not only female focused, but in fact maybe female led societies. Okay, so we have like, for example, in this particular culture, you know, these prehistoric figurines uh, that are from the Stone Age, and we have, if we're gonna do the focus today, we're gonna to do actually multiple lectures on the feminine divine, and so there's not, we're not only gonna do Greece, we're also going to do um, the Middle East and I think also India. And so there is a, a bunch of other places we can look, but I'm doing Greece today, so that's what, why we're, we're looking for, trying to find what's between here and here. The classical Greek gods that we started with, that when writing starts happening in the 700s, are already sort of fully formed in these uh, very patriarchal pantheons of Olympians led by Zeus, right? So we have here when, when that emerges, this is again is another one of those examples of um, the mother god and uh, her younger consort image, anyway, the imagery of it here is not actually the consort, but it's Her Hera and Heracles, right? They actually end up being enemies. But in any event, uh, the same image that we saw. Okay, so I like to sometimes when we're gonna try to get uh, to look at time, to do a time map like this. And so we should just remember, even if we go all the way back, this is all BCE, so even if we go back 4,000 years BCE, to get to those figurines when they start appearing, that is way over here on the screen, you know, so way off the screen. So those um, are 36,000 years before that. Um, and so uh, when we looked at where those Indo-Europeans were in that their steppe homeland, they are probably now already there by about 4,000. 
but that's still going to be before we get any kind of writing. So that's why we have to just um, we have to try to identify them based on our clues that we get from the archaeology and based on our linguistic evidence. Uh, and it's only then when writing starts to be developed. So here in ancient Greece and then so on and so forth that we get to sorry ancient Egypt that we are going to get to start writing stuff down. And so even with the one of the oldest civilizations, Egypt is only sin, and then emerging in this kind of time frame into the Bronze Age. Uh, the Indo-Europeans at that point are expanding. They expand into Anatolia, what's now Turkey, and ultimately into India, Iran, all the different places they go. There are Indo-European empires in the, in the period of time um, right before the Bronze Age collapse, so the Hittites in Anatolia are Indo-European speaking people, as are the Mycenaeans, who are the earliest speakers of a proto-Greek language, an early Greek language. And then we're also going to note here the existence of the Minoans. We've talked a bunch about how around the year 1200 BCE there was a general collapse of all of these Bronze Age civilizations, except the Egyptians mostly, um, as invaders like the Sea Peoples and possibly the historical memory was of this sort of Dorians, which is to say a new group of Greeks maybe. And so maybe we're looking for this thing happening where, again, these patriarchal invaders are maybe coming in. We're not sure. Anyway, that's been one of the theories who then cause, in the Greek world, uh, whereas the Minoans had a language that is written down in a, in a thing that scholars call Linear A, and the Mycenaeans are writing down in a, in a language that is, again, an alphabet or, I'm sorry, a, a writing system that is based on Linear A. They're writing the old, earlier archaic Greek in Linear B. This is one of those rare occasions when they actually, the civilization collapse is so bad that they lose writing. Usually writing is such a a useful tool that you don't stop doing it even when civilization collapses. Uh, and so then that's why there's this dark age for the Greeks before we have the development of the Greek alphabet as we know it. And again, these writers like Homer and Hesiod who are, for, are the for, they're not writers, these uh, epic poets that are composing um, the mythologies as we kind of know them. Anyway, coming down to the more uh, known historic time periods of the Roman Empire. So you can kind of see anyway this long kind of uh, zone here. There's a bunch of space where we're having to rely on archaeology, right? Because there's not very much writing. And even when there is writing, for example, when we get to the Minoans here, that writing is undeciphered. So we can't actually read it, so it can't help us with, uh, with what we know. Okay, so are there direct connections? <laughs> So there is um, one that's quite tantalizing. Um, so we have these prehistoric figures, and we have historic period great goddesses. And so uh, in specifically in Anatolia, in what's now Turkey, um, there is in the historic period uh, a goddess named Kibbele, which is uh, a great mother, and she is the patron of the ancient people known as the Phrygians, who are a Anatolian neighbor of the Greeks. So the Greeks are living on the coast right next to these guys, the Phrygians. Uh, and, and she is known in historic times. And you can kind of see, um, intermediate, there is in a archaeological site, which I guess is called Cetal Hoyuk. Cetal Hoyuk? Okay. Uh, Cetal Hoyuk um, uh, found at about a 6,000 BC age. Um, you can kind of see there's a lot of similarities here, which is to say where you have a uh, figurine that ha has, let's say, exaggerated female features. Um, in this case, though, is also seated, seated on a throne. And also the throne actually has maybe these two animals on either side of it, cats, lionesses, or lions. And, um, uh, and then we can see that obviously later, this classical sculpture, Sibylle has those same, um, you know, figures that are part of her throne. Okay, so where is it all? <laughs> so as we look at um, Anatolia, uh, this is uh, Chetelhuyk here is um, not contemporaneous to Phrygia, but anyway, it's an older settlement, an older site. 
uh, that's actually many thousands of years older, but it's in the same area that's going to become Phrygia. And so just to kind of point that out. So the Greeks are gonna be around here on the coasts and cities, and the Phrygians are in the middle, and these are the people that are in a town with the same, seemingly the same goddess maybe, although it's, not a, it's a preliterate society that is in the same place. So it seems like a pretty good connection. Okay, so what does this town, Chetelhuyuk, look like? So it's a town that had maybe five to 7,000 people in it, and it's inhabited between 700, 7100 and 5600 BCE, so a long, long time ago, but in between some of those earlier time periods in terms of the figures. It's an interesting site. <laughs> So all of the different <laughs> buildings that are in the town are kind of roughly the same size. So it's not that there's some giant king's uh, palace that is maybe in the middle and, every, and then there's all kinds of peasant houses all around. Uh, rather, everybody's kind of got the same kind of size dwelling. Um, they have not found the need to or maybe invented the idea of a street yet. And so instead, all the buildings are all up against each other. And so you have to um, kind of go around through them and walk down into them through these ladders. Um, they are very clean, <laughs> so they are not uh, leaving their junk around everywhere, and they also um, have burials uh, within, the, within the town. Um, and there's all kinds of imagery, uh, including um, uh, images of, of male figures, male humans with erect phalluses. Those are doing hunting scenes. Uh, those hunting scenes include stags. They include aurochs, which is to say the extinct ancestor of the undomesticated, or the domesticated cattle. And so these would have been around and they would have been hunting them. Uh, vultures, lions, and then there's also female human figures or female figures, I'm saying human, but these, all the male figures could also be divine, they could be gods, they could be heroes, we don't know because it looks like human, but anyway, it could be all the figures, including frankly the, the animals could all be divine too. The God, those could all be spirits or gods. And then again, female figures, women, and so much, much more. So it's a, it has a lot of uh, symbology. Okay, because it predates writing, <laughs> and this is gonna be always the problem with all of this stuff, everything about the site is open to interpretation and is actually very controversial. So you can, um, you can suggest that uh, because something is, is done this way, it means this, and if it's done something that way, it means that. So the first archeological team in the 1960s um, uh, argued pretty strongly that the remains implied a matriarchy. Um, and so for a lot of the reasons that we've already talked about, so that they don't seem, they're not particularly weapons focused, they're not, it's not a defended site, there's more female figurines, or um, there's a bunch of explicitly female figurines and there's a bunch of figurines that they identified as, uh, that aren't explicitly male. <laughs> which may have been female, but, the, it's, um, but not every one of these anyway um, has this form of the very obvious uh, divine mother too. So anyway, they're also um, the current team that's been working more recently has argued that the case is more ambiguous. So the one thing though that we know is that this, um, for example, this seated woman really does resemble um, a goddess whose name is known in the historic period, right? So in the historic period, um, the Phrygians worshipped a goddess called Mater Cubilia, which is to say Sibylle, um, which is to say the, probably in Phrygian that might mean uh, Mother Mountain, so in other words an earth goddess uh, from their location. Uh, her worship is adopted by the Romans, so the Romans had a tradition of um, at different times they would consult the oracles, and the oracles would sometimes tell them that what needed to be done is you needed to invite some foreign god, essentially, or foreign goddess into the city. And the Romans um, were told at a certain point that they needed to invite uh, Sibylle into their city, which they um, called, ma calling her Magna Mater. So the Roman understanding of how this religion worked off in Phrygia is that she's the great mother, the mother of the gods. Uh, and so her son, consort, is in, in, in the same way that we see in these kind of great goddess religions. We've talked in many occasions where there's essentially, there's, we've had the mother goddess and then a the smaller, younger um, male consort. And so her son consort in this case is called Attis. Um, and Attis, which might mean priest, 
um, is also may have been the prototype for her distinctive priests, which are also known in the historic time period, the galley. And so these galley, um, as part of their worship, castrated themselves and were then kind of recognized as a third gender, neither male nor female. The Romans were, um, in the West anyway, the Latin Romans initially are very anti-castration, and so they, um, they would actually make laws against doing this, but anyway, they, this is something that would happen in the East and was part of, um, and there was a festival for it when the, uh, when the priests would self-castrate themselves and things like that. And so, um, I don't know, for most, um, I think males, the idea of self-castration does sound like a matriarchal idea. <laughs> I don't know, but it doesn't have to be. <laughs> so in any event, this is what's, um, uh, what, how Sibylle is known in, as she enters into the historical period. Okay, so we men maybe have that, this great connection to the great goddess in Anatolia. However, it's, although um, Sibylle makes her way into Rome and is understood um, <coughs> by the Greeks is to be associated with some of their goddesses. Uh, nevertheless, her worship doesn't really um, take on in, in Greece, and so it's not as good an example that we have, let's say, uh, when we were trying to have those examples of Zeus marrying somebody, and that, so on and so forth. And so um, I want to look at another um, option that maybe will get us closer. Um, and so this is the... Um, Minoan snake goddesses, we'll call, or as they're called, or goddess figurines, or women with snake figurines that have been found uh, in the archaeological excavations in the island of Crete. And so these have been dated to um, between 1700 and 1450 BC, which is uh, in the Bronze Age in this period of time, a few hundred, few hundred years before the Bronze Age collapse. And so there is a high civilization on Crete that is directly related to the later Greek civilizations. And so I want to see if there's a connection here between this great goddess and the classical Greek gods that are beginning in the 750s. So coming back to my, <laughs> my timeline. So um, we had, uh, again, the Anatolian great goddess is already um, you know, getting off the chart here, so they didn't make it onto the chart because it's so many thousand years back. Um, but she's continuing to exist and uh, is found in this historic period and is brought to Rome. Um, so in this, prior to the historic period, this Bronze Age collapse moment, we have, as we mentioned, the Mycenaean civilization, which is on the mainland of ancient Greece and also Anatolia, and the Minoan civilization, um, which is on Crete. And this one is richer, older, but ultimately gets conquered by the Mycenaeans. Yes? Yeah. Um, John, I don't know if you're going to mention, but um, just going back a little bit before the um, Dorian invasions, the Hittites, etc., uh, I'm thinking in the Fertile Crescent, like present-day Iraq, ancient Sumer, they had a very, very um, major deity, Inanna. Yes. And uh, it's believed that from her, you know, various goddess images later evolved. And so that's near enough in the Near East to possibly be influential as well. And the ancient Sumerians go back to, again, to about 5,000 BC, oh, yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah. So she was a very early and very uh, figure and very potent as a deity too. And I totally agree, and that's why we ended up splitting this into um, multiple lectures. Oh. <laughs> and so um, there is going to be one that is specifically Middle East focused, um, and and that's going to deal more with even also with Aphrodite and so some of the as they've sort of come across from there, because I mean I, it's such a huge topic, and I think, but I totally to your point, um, there are so many of these very powerful goddesses. Um, in all of the different localities, some of which are very early and, you know, at, well, at almost everywhere where we start to encounter the historical record when it first starts, right? So this is like the inheritance that is there right before the, b before the historical periods, including in places where, um, uh, in pl places where writing happens earlier. So, and it's even, even the case here where, um, uh, 
something that's wrong. Uh, you know, even the case here where, where writing goes away again, <laughs> you know, it also seems like there's something that's just on the verge of in front of the ancient Greek times, right? So when, it, when it's classical. So in the same way that before, um, before we first have writing here in the Mycenaeans with the Minoans, um, it, it, we, ha we are seeing these kind of signs and also right here before classical Greek. Likewise, before Egyptian and right before the Sumerian are, are also doing their writing, they also, as they first write things down, they are in having um, these great mothers. Yeah. I have a question about uh, Hittites. Um, looks like they had uh, more or less the same territorial um, place like the Afri Africans. Yeah. And they are the Indo-Europeans. And then that's the theory that they came with their um, patriarchal ideas, you said. And, but still, Chatelhuk is in their territory and with the Kibele uh, goddess. It looks like even though they've been there like 2,000, 1,500 years, they still couldn't really eradicate the mother goddess right. um, cult, isn't it? Or right, so that's a good point. So the, um, so in fact, actually, what will be really interesting to find out in terms of this portion of, this, of, the, of the piece is that, as you say, the Hittites are operating here um, before the Phrygians, right? So the Phrygians are going to be here after the Hittites collapse. And so they're the society that kind of emerges out of it. And the Hittites are where we, um, sorry, where the Phrygians, like you say, are maybe holding on to this um, much more autochthonic Sibylle, you know, so this, um, uh, this great mother on the throne, which is from their kind of territory. But in the meantime, we have had a um, incursion of Indo-Europeans into Anatolia, including, like you say, the Phrygian people. And the Hittites are an Indo-European um, uh, uh, kingdom. And, and one of the things that's kind of interesting about them is, I mean, they're also a literate people. And so um, we have just an enormous amount of Hittite records. And the problem with that are, is right now uh, that there's not enough Hittite specialists to even be um, getting anywhere close to translating all of them. And so most of those have not been translated out of Hittite into any language, much less getting them all the way to, to English. And so there's actually lots more to learn about this intermediate steps between specifically the, what's the story that's going on in Anatolia, because we can look at what the Hittites, um, uh, all of the Hittite picture as, as it emerges. And so in fact, actually out of those Hittite records, this is where we've gotten to this um, uh, new understandings perhaps of, of the Trojan War, um, where what the Hittites are completely forgotten by the, by the Greeks by the time Homer and Hesiod are around and we're formulating this. Uh, but in fact, the Hittites record their own, because they're, they're literate back then, they record their own essential version or their understanding of the, of the Trojan War, where it may well be that the Trojans, the Hittites are actually you know, part of this war, <laughs> that the Trojans are actually allied with the Greeks uh, in the in this um, in the in the real war that that may have happened, as opposed to when it's remembered by Homer as a legendary affair when it's only the Trojans. So she. Yeah, I I just wanted to add to Urgent's point that um, the Hittites were known to adopt the gods of everybody around them and everybody they conquered. That's right. Um, and so it's quite possible that they incorporated this mother goddess as one of their pantheon. And then people who wanted to stick with the worship stuck with it. And then when the Hittite Empire dissolved, these people came up as the Phrygians and they just kept with their mother goddess. Right. So that's also true. And so I and I don't and I have to say I don't know the answer. <laughs> so but I do know that the that that's that is true for like the Hittite practice. And so the Hittites in their ceremonial capital city, they would go and grab the the main cult statue of whoever they conquered and they bring it back, and they bring that religion back. And so they're doing like kind of the Romans did, only they did it with everybody. <laughs> and so at a certain point, um, they are so busy doing, the, the, the Hittite king is so busy doing everybody's ceremonial uh, that that becomes like, like an everyday job that the Hittite king has to spend all his days doing, you know, whoever's festivals today, whatever one of these gods that they stole from whoever, <laughs> you know. And so it may well be, that may well be how it survived because they, the Hittites maybe were not, um, they were trying to, um, take 
it all in as opposed to eradicating everybody like the, um, the Assyrians might have wanted to do. Okay, so let's look at the Minoans a little bit. So um, um, we kind of mentioned kind of the my, uh, Minoan and Mycenaean, Mycenaean area. So uh, speaking of um, the Trojan War, so the Trojan War as we were entering into um, the era when archaeology is being invented, um, most modern people had decided, well, this is just a myth, it's not real. And so uh, uh, Schliemann went and said, no, I'm going to go find it. And so he, um, before really archaeology is invented, he's essentially a, um, a plunderer uh, and, and kind of destroys the archaeological uh, site of Troy, but does discover that, no, there really was a, a place, Troy. And so that actually changed, um, you know, revolutionized what people thought of this kind of time period in history. And so one of the other things that was true is that in the Iliad, um, quite bizarrely, the main Greek king comes from this town, Mycen uh, Mycenae, which in the classical period is not important at all. So you would have thought that, um, you know, you know, that the main kings would be placed from places like Athens and Sparta. Well, Sparta certainly is represented. Uh, my, uh, king Agamemnon, who's from Mycenae's brother, is the king of Sparta. Uh, but in any event, uh, Schliemann then also went to Mycenae and said, well, it must be that that was important too, and that's why uh, this would be that case, since he, lo and behold, also found uh, the remains of a very important um, earlier civilization, a Bronze Age um, Greek civilization, which have been then called the Mycenaeans uh, by scholars because their, their first major center was found at Mycenae. And so uh, the Mycenaeans ultimately are, are using a written language that's derived from the written language of Crete, and um, sorry, the alphabet or the writing system is derived from the written language of Crete, but they're writing a, a proto-Greek or an archaic Greek language. And so as a result, we have been able to confirm that the Mycenaeans are you know, you know, already a Greek speaking or already an Indo-European people, um, but they were very influenced therefore by this civilization uh, that occurs, that is existing on Crete. So in the classical period of Greek mythology, um, there's a memory uh, from the kind of proto-heroic time period of when there was a very high and rich and powerful civilization that's based on Crete. And so there is a legendary king called Minos, and he has a, a daughter, Ariadne, and he has a child that's half bull called the Minotaur. And the Minotaur is kept in a labyrinth on Crete, and because the uh, Cretans are so um, uh, rich and powerful, they are able to um, have a tributary status over all of the Greek city-states, including specifically Athens. And so Athens is much weaker in the uh, memory of the classical Greeks in this archaic period that they, they kind of only have shadowy, vague memories of. Uh, and so as a result of that, the Cretan peoples, we'll start to call the Minoans after their king, Minos here. The Minoan peoples, according to this memory, um, require, for example, uh, the Athenians to, sac uh, to send uh, a tribute of, of young men and women who will, be <coughs> excuse me, who will be offered as human sacrifices to the Minotaur. And so that's sort of the um, mythological memory that occurs in the historical period that there's this King Minos, there's a Minotaur, there's a labyrinth, and uh, a very powerful civilization is remembered. Um, and lo and behold, when they went to um, start to do the uh, excavating in, in Knossos, um, they found big palatial centers, uh, and in, within that they found all sorts of uh, incredible imagery, including lots of imagery involving uh, bulls. So the idea that the bull is actually, was remembered as being part of um, uh, Minoan worship is actually, uh, has, a, has a background in it. Yeah, Valerie. Um, just a little aside. Um, I was reading about the evolution of the domesticated animals within the last couple of weeks. I just got a new book. Yeah. And yeah, like you were mentioning, um, our present day cattle are um, uh, developed from uh, wild aurochs. Yeah. And they said that the average Oroch bull was a, 
about three times the size of a present day ball. Oh, wow. And so what we're seeing there in the picture might be actually closer to the then reality. Oh. And apparently there were still some wild uh, aurochs to be seen in Gaul when Julius Caesar was there uh, for conquest. And he saw one, and he was so overawed that he wrote this you know, sort of, um, sort of pay unto the auroch, and he exclaimed, they're the size of elephants. <laughs> <laughs> wow, very cool. Yeah, and so may well, maybe what they're doing here is, it's, we're calling it bull riding, but may well be auroch riding then, I guess, right? Since the size, or at least maybe bulls aren't as small. Yeah, they were closer back then to what the aurochs were like. So anyway, so they're, here they are doing, um, you know, it's not bull fighting, but it's bull dancing, right? I guess they're also fighting. Okay, so the focus um, of the Minoan religion, again, are, we um, are again dealing with uh, the problem of not being able to read their language. <laughs> and so although they are literate and they have a language that is written down in a writing system that's called Linear A, um, the problem with it is, is that even though this writing system is clearly the ancestor of the, the Linear B that we can read and decipher, um, the problem is that uh, there's not enough linear A and um, it's not probably a language that we know or ha that, uh, that, has that has continued. So it's probably not written in Greek. It's probably a, a Cretan pre-Greek um, you know, pre language. And so it hasn't ever been able to, so the Minoan language hasn't been able to be deciphered yet. And so unfortunately, we're back in this place where all of the imagery is, is um, open to speculation. And it's exciting and uh, tantalizing, but anyway, so one of the things then that people have seen is that there's all of these artifacts. The religion seems to have involved, um, you know, been led by priestesses that worship a goddess who is associated with various animals. So this one here has snakes, uh, but also there's doves, bulls, as we've seen. And uh, although it's pictured less, there's also the idea of a young consort uh, slash son. So the same imagery that has continued all through as we've seen them. Um, also, we have all kinds of different depictions uh, throughout uh, the Minoan artifacts of women in positions of authority. Um, and so at the very minimum, this shows that, um, that probably uh, the society was at least more egalitarian in terms of the genders is, is, is almost inarguable. Um, and people have said, have felt anyway, that this is maybe the best candidate we have <coughs> artifact-wise for um, a matriarchal society. However, of course, because we don't have the writing at this point yet, some of that interpretation is speculative. We also are having that situation that we've described many times where the, the palaces themselves are not, and they have large complexes, but they're not fortified. Uh, and so that's also given the idea that maybe they are peaceful, or at least within the their own island, they are able to be peaceful with each other. Although, as opposed to some of the other places where we've seen, um, where the people, have, uh, like we had with Chatelhoek, where um, there aren't palaces, you know, everybody is more egalitarian. There is at least in the minimum, even if it's um, um, women focused and peaceful, um, it would at least be very hierarchical still because there's lots of wealth and some stratification in the society here. Um, so that would be one part where it's not like maybe some of the other things we're looking at, but it's also possible to have a hierarchy-focused matriarchy. Um, one of the things that ha occurs in all of these images is that the um, women have like a lot more fancy clothes than the guys who are, <laughs> you know, anyway, wear less. So anyway, when it's, um, I, would, I would say the part of the, where we are when we're looking at it from the Greek side, uh, including the Minoans, which are really tantalizing. Um, in the end, we would like to find, I think, a matriarchy, um, because I think, I think we'd all think that would be really cool to find. But in the end, we also have had to build a lot of this still on speculation. And so in some senses, um, the, these are reconstructions, right? So artistic reconstructions of what it maybe looked like. Um, in some cases, um, when you are speculating, and unfortunately, when we're in the realm of archaeology, in order to create narrative at all, you have to essentially tell stories, but the stories are based on where you find things, what, what, uh, where things, uh, what things appear to us. But on when we're doing that, unfortunately, we can also get to a place where um, 
the appearances like a, a Rorsach test for us where sometimes what comes out is what we would prefer it to be. Um, and so that's why always the closer we can stick to the actual sources, the, the, the safer our academic ground. So it doesn't mean that any of this is impossible. It could be very possible, um, but it's hard to say conclusively either way. Um, one thing that we can say is um, that just because there is goddess worship in the historic era, that doesn't always mean um, that that corresponds to either matriarchy or even uh, egalitarian, relative egalitarian position for women in the society. So, I mean, this is a cult uh, reconstruction of the cult statue of Athena, the patron of Athens, and we noted that classical Athens is not well known for its uh, treatment of women at all. And so the fact that the Athenians, the classical Athenians, had a female goddess as their patron um, didn't mean that they had uh, a better treatment of women. Likewise, um, as we kind of have seen in that continuation of it, uh, the fact that there really was just this amazing devotion in the central Middle Ages to Marian worship in Christianity. So all of these, um, the outpouring of all of the cathedrals, all of the artwork, they're all called Notre Dame, they're all called Our Lady, right? Um, uh, and there is all that kind of focus. And yet the status of women in the medieval societies, um, you know, obviously were, it wasn't, certainly wasn't matriarchal or even matrifocal or matrilineal and all those kind of senses. And so um, anyway, it doesn't always mean the same. The one nice thing that we have for some of the societies, like as with the Minoans is, at least with the Minoans, we have, um, lots of images of what seem to be more like daily life or real life um, uh, where women are in positions of authority. And so we can at the minimum say that this is probably a society that was closer to um, what we are looking for if we're looking to find a matriarchy in the past. Okay, that said, <laughs> so there has been a lot of pushback <laughs> um, on this idea. And so um, it's very enticing, but there has been um, a pretty strong pushback in terms of this may be just out too far in terms of speculation on the evidence. So um, apparently most mainstream archaeologists have dismissed the, this theory of um, the later theories that the, the pre-Indo-Europeans are matristic. The, the, again, this idea, this Kurgan thesis that she has is pretty still, I think, uh, open and, and, and actually looking pretty good. Um, but this question about all the other societies maybe being matristic might be too, a bridge too far for most of the uh, archaeologists. And so specifically then um, in how to understand how we got to a very heavily developed idea of this, a um, uh, religious studies scholar from Claremont Graduate University, Cynthia Eller, has written, for example, what she calls the myth of the matriarchal prehistory she, it's called, subtitled, Why an Invented Past Won't Give Women a Future. So she's made a very strong counter-argument that is maybe too strong, but that's what often happens when, when this happens. So she says, um, she calls that it, this a myth, and she also calls it an ennobling lie, and she argues anyway in her book that this isn't based on um, enough evidence to prove it, but she also thinks that it's not useful for feminists in terms of building an egalitarian future. So that's, again, arguable, too, about how, what's the best strategy for building a better future. So, yeah, Valerie. Yeah, um, I just wanted to add that um, Gimbutas' theory uh, kind of developed at the height of second wave feminism, which yes. in the main was um, uh, formulated, uh, you know, sort of as a body of theories in alliance with classical left-wing thought. Yes. Um, they sourced... Uh, works by, for instance, Engels, uh, Marx's uh, compatriot and uh, co-theorist about how human society developed um, economically. Yeah. And so sh this was partly a strategic move on the part of certain feminists, I suspect also again Buddhists, because they were presenting more an ideology, an ideology that though might not have been by them uh, admitted as, uh, let's say, uh, pious hope, yeah, but yeah. strategically can be presented as historical quasi fact to um, you know to try to engineer the movement of society towards that pious hope. Right. Yeah. And so I think that you know at the time period, let's say when it's formulated, 
And it does, it, it, we've gone through it, it's very enticing, right? So I mean, there's all these reasons why, um, you know, and, we, and I think that there's reasons why we would like that to have maybe been true for, like you say, the hope that, um, there's a lot of times when we feel like, uh, especially let's say in religion, and this is a discussion of religion, um, that what's seemed viewed as more valid in religion is what was before. So generally speaking, um, you don't announce, you know, when you're starting a new religion, you don't announce, boy, I got a brand new religion here. You guys are all gonna wanna join up, <laughs> you know. Instead, uh, you generally speaking are, uh, present uh, your new religion as a refoundation or a ref, uh, restoration or a reformation of the ancient religion, you know. And so Muhammad is not the first prophet of Islam. He is the last prophet of Islam. <laughs> which goes all the way back as far as Muhammad um, tells the story to Adam and Eve. So there is no, um, uh, there's not a new religion. And same, likewise, uh, Joseph Smith and Mormonism. Joseph Smith is not the founder of Mormonism. He is merely, you know, the leader of a, a re restored church that he is organizing. He is not founding it explicitly uh, because it's the, the true church has always been there and has just been off the face of the earth and he has now restored it. Um, likewise here, if we can trace into the actual um, roots of, uh, of religion, goddess worship, and we see that that's actually the, let's say, the original um, uh, prehistoric, but nevertheless the original uh, re religion of civilization itself. So when these societies become agrarian and they create things like cities and towns and, and law and everything like that, that they were naturally more in tune with nature and they are, are more peaceful and they are um, uh, female-centered <laughs> and female-led maybe, um, then maybe if we were to go back to um, being, you know, having women have a stronger place in the society and women being leaders, that we would maybe be, uh, have a society that's more peaceful and that's more in tune with nature and all of those kind of things. And so I think that that's maybe like you say, the. Um, the pious hope and maybe what, one of the reasons why that would have been something that people would have wanted to discover um, and maybe, and they did discover, <laughs> um, but this is also an argument about why, for example, now religious studies scholars have argued maybe, maybe they um, discovered what they wanted to discover more, a little too much more than what they actually discovered. And so that's anyway kind of where, um, where things are right now in terms of this argument on this particular hypothesis. So from that, I want to make my own pious discussion, <laughs> my own pious suggestion um, for the divine feminine in the 21st century Christianity and also beyond actually. So it doesn't have to be in Christianity, although I'm gonna start here with Christianity's own muddled mess, <laughs> you know, of viewing um, the divine. So what I wanna suggest and actually do is getting rid of um, talking about God um, as default in default male terms. Uh, and so in other words, to instead of just having things be nominally inclusive of the divine feminine the way it is in Christianity and Christian theology, but is nevertheless is also um, presented as that uh, default male zone, right? And so how do we do that? So for one thing, I think that we now have the linguistic apparatus, um, as we have all in our society, sort of started to realize that gender is not binary, and we are, are working on being able to use they, them pronouns. Um, I think that we can also, if we all were to start using they, them pronouns when talking about God and never use he, him pronouns, um, then that will automatically change um, people's thinking about how they think of the divine and ultimately how they, um, what they mean or what they envision when they use the word God. And I know it works because I, I when I, <laughs> I myself, you know, stop using, I stop using, you know, he, him pronouns for thinking about God. And when I hear it, it jars me because it makes me think, what are you talking about? You know, that's not what, that's not what God is, is. God is not he, him. And the same thing, um, we're going to make a, another lecture here about where, why um, the academic case for why, for example, the Gospel of Luke is actually written by a woman. And so I also kind of convinced myself of that and whether that's not, that can't be proof. But anyway, <laughs> it's, there's, it's, a, it's an argument that I like. And so, and so as a result, I think of as a default in my head of, of Luke as female, 
but I try to use non-gendered language when I'm, when I'm talking about the author of Luke. But when I hear people say Luke, he, him, you know, and then I think, no, no, that's not right, because Luke is a woman. <laughs> and so anyway, so I think that if you actually do set that default, and if we do use they, them language, that that's going to be um, a big pa- um, step forward in, in, in recapturing the actual theology, which is uh, that is, God is not default male, God is inclusive of gender in all Abrahamic religion in general, but Christianity being formulated here in particular. So next, um, taking uh, gender-specific formulations like father, son, mother of God, queen of heaven, and integrating them kind of together um, with the idea then that we promote concepts of the divine that include or transcend gender, since gender, as we also know, is not necessarily, or it's not binary. So where we talk of God, the divine, instead of saying father, heavenly parent, the creator, the source, instead of saying, focusing on uh, the son of God, in the Christian sense, we think of the second person as the logos, the savior, or as simply love, and that's also a Christian definition of God. And same thing, the spirit's already pretty, pretty not gender neutral because we just think of the dove <laughs> anyway. So anyway, that is my proposal for how we can anyway in the 21st century within Christianity um, uh, recapture the divine feminine and also though within Abrahamic religion by simply, um, you don't have to worry about these persons, but you can instead, uh, again, remove he, him language and that will help uh, the thinking recapture the feminine divine. And that's my take on the feminine divine. <laughs> previous, previous but let's give it to. Sorry, but before before we start, I just wanted to say if there's anyone in the audience who came uh, up and advertised him for the badass Habibis lecture, that has been postponed until next week. Um, but Shaheen is here. If you came for that lecture, you can talk to her, and then hopefully she'll talk to you into coming back next week. <laughs> yeah. So we tried to make this topic be also. Um, of interest to anybody who came for that one? <laughs> and if, if so, I hope it did uh, interest you. <laughs> but if not, we promise you next week and it'll be fantastic. So yes. Two slides back when you had the book cover. You, uh, this yeah. one. Do you, do you know what that hand image is? Uh, it looks like an x-ray, but is that what it is? I do not know because oh. I didn't, I, um, I've only read summaries of this oh. book. So oh. unfortunately I didn't able to get it from the library in time right. to, yeah. to, to it's not an X-ray. It's not an X-ray. Obviously not. But it's. Um, there might be handprints, like on the, you know, on the caves where they used to blow paint. Oh, okay. And, you know, do do prints. Sorry, there might be those handprints that you used to see in uh, cave paintings from like yeah. tens of thousands of years ago, where they would like uh, blow um, paint, right. spatter paint on when they held their hands against the cave wall, and to this day there are still these images of hands, and they look a little bit like that. Covering them with <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't know, so we'll have to look it up what the what the exact image is, but that's a good speculation. What was <laughs> Cynthia Eller's um, argument against Maria Gimbuta's? What's her argument against it? Yeah. So the argument is, <laughs> yeah, that that um, that there's too much speculation upon speculation in order to get there, and that specifically. Um, I think that it's actually fairly close to what Val- Valerie is saying here, which is that it's coming out of a um, second wave feminist and uh, potentially Marxist tradition of read how we're reading history that is maybe um, uh, too able to uh, look at these uh, these sequences and trend lines and deciding this is a stage of history and this is a stage of history and this is what must come before that, uh, that it's not, um, that we don't, and, and that ultimately um, even though we might have God, <coughs> goddess-focused, uh, when we might argue that these are goddess-focused uh, religions, um, we can't actually even say that the figurines are goddesses. But anyway, even though we, we're pretty confident that that's probably these are goddesses based on how we know p- humans operate, um, we can't say that it's necessarily um, uh, matriarchal or matristic or um, you know, matrifocused or matrilocal. <laughs> or matrilineal just because they have goddess Im- imagery. So, so unfortunately, um, a lot of these other societies, we just have too little other than to say that we think 
let's say women are more peaceful and so they don't have walls that they're defending. Well, the Minoans may not have been peaceful. They may actually have just been, uh, they may have been sailing around in their navy and they might have had naval supremacy uh, and they might, I mean, the, again, the, the Athenians remembered them as being, um, you know, exacting tribute from them. Uh, whether or not that's not historical, that's a that's a mythic memory. But in other words, there there's may well be that the Mycenaeans are 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 may not be um, they may not be peaceful. Uh, they may just not be vulnerable to attack because they have a great navy. And also, though, it may well be that having a matri since we don't have any matriarchies, <laughs> it may well be that matriarchies, let's say, uh, aren't necessarily don't want walls. Maybe they do want walls. <laughs> you know, and and it may well be that. Um, uh, anyway, so they, all of these things seem to start to be too much speculation upon speculation is I think the argument. And so instead, the, the point of it is, is that, that there is a, a desire to want to have a matriarchy for the kind of purpose that we talked about, and that that's maybe where it appeared when, out of when there's not enough evidence to, to conclusively say so anyway. It doesn't mean that there's not uh, one, because <laughs> we can't prove that there isn't one, certainly. Um, but it's that we um, haven't ever had one in the historic record, and so we can't actually um, say for sure that that's what it was. She. Yeah, um, I just wanted to say that, like, just you know, going on from what you're saying is that, you know, if if there was evidence that you know there were all these that all societies that started out early were somehow matriarchal yeah. and peaceful, it's like, okay, well, let's look at the evidence. Look at Egypt, you know, which wasn't invaded for thousands of years. And you look at how their economy and religion developed. Yeah. And you don't have just goddesses. Yeah. You know? So if that so that's for sure. Uh, that so strikes Egypt that would down. Be a, so. would be an extra yeah. example of one where it doesn't happen. And e Egypt even has, you know, very strong um, uh, mother goddess again who yeah. has a young consort and all those kind of things. Uh, and and were <laughs> they were extremely in relatively egalitarian society, you know, like yep. the only thing that's better than what they had is what we have now. Um, and also if you look at cultures or societies that are matrilineal or close to matriarchal, so if you look at the Tuareg, they're very yeah. warlike. Um, yeah. <laughs> and if you look at some of the indigenous um, matriarchal, like the Haudenosaunee, right. they're also warlike. Right. So just because just being matriarchal doesn't guarantee being peace loving and anti-war. Right, so yeah, again, like we uh, used as one of the actual examples, the Haudenosaunee, where, who are not matriarchal, <laughs> but who are, um, what do we say, matrilocal and matrilineal, and that yet nevertheless, they successfully conquered and defeated all of the other First Nations peoples of, you know, that were anywhere near them, you know, and up, you know, pro up to the colonial times. Yeah, just an explanation maybe, if not necessarily defense of Gimbutas' theory, um, um, unlike Engels, who pretty well argued that um, there was a time when all pr early, early human societies were communitarian and communistic, mm. and there was no no private property, um, and therefore you know there were equal relations and everybody cared and shared. Yeah. Um, uh, she did not claim that all human societies were at some point uh, oh, right. on the same reasoning. Yeah. Also. Uh, ma uh, matrilineal and, and um, uh, mat uh, matristic, but but she focused specifically on a case, yeah. and which is again this tripillion. By the way, tripilia in uh, Ukrainian means three field, three pole, which means three fields. Um, it was also known as the Kukutini culture, uh, based on the discoveries of I believe a German archaeologist in Romania, northern Mar Romania in. 1800s, so it's the Cucutini Tripili and culture sort of more commonly known. Yeah. That's what she was looking at, and yeah. she was um, like, like some, it's the, again, the pious hope, feminist second wave pious hope, if we can find an instance of an evolved, complex, you know, sort of uh, populist society that also did not seem to practice war and hierarchy, yes. and no palaces, no defensive weapons, no offensive weapons, no defenses, and yet here are all these folks living together, you know, up to 20,000 in you yeah. know, large communities with, you know, considerable uh, elaboration of structure and practices and, and art and whatnot, then maybe, just maybe, you know, we can do that again. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you yeah. You know, so, you know, he, she found one instance where yeah. it seemed as though, and also lots of, you know, female figurines 
and other you know Im imagery related with what seemed to be the divine feminine, ergo. Right. Right. And so that's what, where she was heading with that theory. And and by the way, I I find I mean, wouldn't have gone through and done an entire lecture <laughs> if I didn't find the idea and the hypothesis extremely intriguing. Um, the, pro the I guess I'm just saying that the uh, having talked to I wanted to do at the end of this I didn't want to only dump a bucket of cold water on everybody but I, I also wanted to say that um, that the the reason why the the reason why essentially like where a lot of where academics are right now is not um, isn't that we feeling that we found you know the case that we can do that and that why there's been this kind of, this level of pushback not to say that we potentially couldn't if, especially for example if we were to um, for example, translate linear A, <laughs> you know, that would, that would potentially be very helpful as we've gone through when we look at what some of the intervening story is among the Hittites as we get some more of that records. Um, and so, so anyway, so thank you for adding all, you know, like the rest of that side of it. I also feel like sometimes what happens when academics um, um, make a strong case and then people make a very strong counter case is that um, people will overstate what the original case was in order to knock it down more. And so certainly um, one of the things that happens uh, is, like you say, taking something that where they're only claiming, let's say, patristic, and they're only saying we're only maybe finding one source of it to this larger great goddess theory that everybody had one, let's say, at some point, and that, um, and that it had to be matriarchal as opposed to one of these other uh, women-focused ideas. Yeah, well, a later second wave feminist took her theory and went wild with it, and yeah. that's possibly what's being countered. Right. About this uh, goddess, how do, how has this anything to do with the Medusa or pre-Medusa? So yeah, does the question is, does this have anything to do with Medusa? And so I, I would snakes. say, <laughs> yeah, the thing that's in common is a woman and snakes. <laughs> and, so, um, and so there is this, um, this is going on. Uh, we were talking, um, Shaheen already mentioned the, the Pythia, the Oracle of Delphi. And so there's another example of, um, Priestess, essentially the, the oracle herself, and then also the snake, which is the python. And so um, there is a, um, a memory <laughs> um, that is expressed, you know, that they didn't, they didn't have these figurines, we had to dig them up, but the classical Greeks are remembering um, a powerful, um, scary <laughs> uh, female uh, uh, god, great goddesses or goddesses that are associated with snakes. And so probably the Medusa, Medusa, which is, um, I think she's at the Titan level of the, of, of the, of the purse or something. I don't know, maybe she's not. So in, in any event, I'm thinking of Clash of the Titans. That's, <laughs> so that's, a, that's a wrong comparison to be making. But anyway, so that um, when, when she is uh, less of a, but anyway, less of a human looking, let's say, uh, because she's so you know, frightful to look upon that, um, with the snakes and everything like that, that she turns you to stone. It may well be, again, this, uh, a memory of this kind of um, negative force or a way to say that the force is negative in, within our new framework, which is the hero who's slaying the snake, the, the female um, powerful Medusa. Okay, oh, one more. <laughs> I, uh, just what you were saying, um, you know, and maybe if you could uh, sort of bring up that slide where we should change the name of God yeah. to they, them, you know, change the gender yep. and all yep. of that. So that's working on the nouns and the pronouns. Um, I think we're going to have to work on the adjectives too if, if that's going to happen. Um, I recall seeing studies, I, I did uh, gender studies when I did uh, a minor in sociology way back a long time ago. And there were these experiments done with the usual hapless undergraduate subjects <laughs> you know, who volunteer for, you know, in order to get better marks. Anyway, and so they did lists of adjectives um, at random. Okay. And, and they asked these you know, fairly educated modern young people, and this is back in the 70s, 80s, to attribute them to male or female. Oh. And there were adjectives like you know, authoritative, weak, <laughs> um, rational, emotional, you know, not pairing them like that, but you know, right. at random, um, right. um, powerful, courageous, right. um, soft, tender, <laughs> you know, et cetera. You can no, imagine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And no, so, it's a very good point. and so, lo and behold, those adjectives went, you know, as one can imagine, 
respectively to, to, to the male and to the female. Right. And so what do we think of, uh, you know, now I'm speaking as an atheist, but what in our culture do we think of is we think of God, yeah. authoritative, powerful, um, uh, apex of a powerful hierarchy, possibly bureaucratic, <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, certainly, uh, yeah, you know, if, if there were courage to, you know, it would be beyond human courage. Um, uh -huh you know, heavy emphasis on the rational, logos, whatever, those are not adjectives that even to this day, you know, on the part of the populace are attributed to the female. Yeah. And when females step out of line and start to attribute those qualities, think like Hillary Clinton and the, yeah. you know, sort of the opprobrium she got for acting in whichever powerful and, you know, whatever way, you yeah. know, um, that's part of the problem or issue. It is. You know, until and unless certain of those leadership and power adjectives are attributed to the female, ain't gonna happen. Well, so I, to your point on that, I think that's a, that's a really good point, but I think that we have to also get to a place where we're starting to not, um, uh, not attribute adjectives that way, <laughs> you know, because that's also really important that we aren't doing that. And so, so in fact, one of the problems with the, that I have with the, um, these kind of earlier uh, divine feminine formulations that are even, let's say, even being worked into these, um, ma you know, uh, prototype or uh, theoretical, hypothetical matriarchal societies, is that it's relying on, um, let's say, some of these qualities that we're, you know, deciding that this one has to be a feminine quality and this one has to be um, a masculine quality, and so I think that um, if if we are going to line up. Um, I don't know, if we have to say women are passive, women are weak, you know, men are courageous, men are powerful or something like that, then that's, um, that's, an in, that's an innately a problem. We have to have the divine feminine not be about um, uh, Mary, the intercessor role only, and, the, and that, um, that the male role of the father who is the stern judge role, uh, but rather um, the female, design, uh, uh, the female uh, divine can also be inclusive of a logical, stern, <laughs> you know, <laughs> powerful, uh, courageous uh, thinker, and the male divine, you know, uh, conception can also uh, be someone who loves, <laughs> someone who, uh, you know, who fails, who, you know, who gets up back, up back up again. Whatever these kind of things that are not um, someone who actually asks for directions, <laughs> you know, whatever when, he's, when he gets lost. You know, so so in other words, so we break down. We have to break down these other adjectival, adjectival stereotypes, and in fact, creating like a feminine divine that is only based on um, culturally specific female stereotypes is not helping either. I'd say. So I want to transcend those. Yes. <laughs> so again, thanks, guys, and let's um, conclude there. Is there any other? Come on. Okay, so then we will talk to you guys next week when we are going to do Badass Habibis, we promise. <laughs> and, uh, and we'll see you then.